Fight fans, welcome to the PBC Podcast, brought to you by Premier Boxing Champions with your host, Kenneth Buhari and Michael Rosenthal. Man, it is all about the big fight week here on the PBC Podcast. The fight is upon us, and my co-host, Mike Rosenthal, and I, we've been discussing this fight nonstop. I've been discussing this fight with everybody I see. If I get in uh, Uber, if I'm at the grocery store, if I'm in the elevator, uh, and you know what fight I'm talking about. Errol Spence Jr. versus Terrence Bud Crawford for the undisputed welterweight title. A historic fight, a great matchup. This Saturday night, July 29th, from T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, live on Showtime Pay-Per-View, and of course presented to you by PBC, Premier Boxing Champions. We're going to be digging into that fight heavy uh, on this week's episode. We also have uh, another fighter on that card, unbeaten super middleweight contender, Steven So-Called Nelson, joining us a little later in the show. But first things first, uh, there was another big fight this week, another battle of unbeaten pound-for-pounders. Uh, unified, undefeated, uh, super bantamweight champion Stephen Fulton Jr. traveled to Japan to take on undefeated three division champion Naoya Inoue uh, in Inoue's backyard. And man, Inoue put on just a just a masterful performance. He, he's just a, a great, great fighter. It was a little too much for for Cool Boy. Stop Cool Boy in the eighth round. Mike, what were your thoughts on the fight? Well, I knew in a way it was special, but not necessarily quite that special. Uh, I picked in a way to win the fight, but I had a lot of respect for Fulton going in, you know, like most people did, I think. Uh, I thought the fight would be more competitive than it was. Uh, I wasn't disappointed, though. You know, you don't see truly great performances like that very often. I was just in absolute awe of this guy. He took my breath away. So, um, you know, it wasn't competitive, but it was a special night. Yeah, I, I, yeah, he takes my breath away every time uh, I fight. I see, I watch him fight. I mean, he's just scary, scary good. You, you said you did. You knew he was, he was a, a good fight. You didn't know how good he was. Well, how good is he? Where does he, where does he rank? I have in a way number two on my pound for pound list behind only Crawford for the moment. Uh, but I'm not sure anyone is better than in a way. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever said this but he's almost a perfect fighter from my perspective you know where's the weakness show me uh he obviously is skillful his speed is just insane uh you know we were talking about this off the podcast fulton is a really quick guy but in a way was quicker than he was uh in a way has that power you know he might be the second hardest puncher pound for pound after deontay wilder uh and he's just a killer he has this scary intensity that allows him to put all that together and just destroy his opponents You know, I never thought I would even entertain this concept, particularly in light of Manny Pacquiao's accomplishments and so, you know, so soon after he retired. Uh, But I'm starting to wonder whether Inoue might end up as the greatest Asian fighter of all time by the time he's finished. Uh, I think he's an all time great right now, you know, regardless of origin. Uh, The guy's just incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I think he 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 proved that uh, on Tuesday night. Who would you like to see him face next? What should be next for him? I think he made that pretty clear. You know, he wants to unify all the 122-pound titles. Now, I think that's going to happen late in the fall. Tapalos is a good fighter. He just outpointed uh, Murjan Akhbadalyev to win his titles. And, of course, he's not going to pass up an opportunity to become undisputed champion. But, man, he's going to be walking into a, the lion's den. You know, I think Fulton is better than Tapalos, and we saw what ha- just happened. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know if there's anyone in that division that can, that can beat that guy. What about Fulton? What? what- what do you think of how he looked on, on Tuesday? So I think he was just overwhelmed by what in a way brings into the ring, you know, the speed, the power, the ferocity. Uh, there's really no shame in that. You know, pretty much everyone um, in a way his face has had the same experience. Uh, he had some good Fulton had some good moments. I think in the fifth and seventh rounds, he landed some, some clean eye catching sh- shots, you know, and a lot of in a way's shots landed on, Fulton's gloves, but honestly, I, I'm kind of reaching a little bit. Um, it was just all in a way on Tuesday night in Tokyo, so uh, it is what it is. Um, in a way, it's just in a way, and it, that's how it goes. So, where do you think Fulton goes from here? Honestly, I think Fulton will bounce back. You know, I keep, you know what I keep thinking of is Canelo Alvarez's loss to 
Floyd Mayweather. You know, he took a big swing. He missed, you know, and then he put it behind him. I think that's what Fulton is going to do. Uh, he has ability. You know, we've seen it in big fights. He just needs to learn what he can from the bad experience and move forward. I won't be surprised if he climbs back into title contention pretty quickly, you know, whether that's at 122 or 126. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. And look, I mean, I think Canelo learned a lot from that Mayweather loss. So, you know, Fulton can do the same here. And I think he, he and you you and I spoke about this off the podcast and, uh, you know, you, you wrote about it uh, on the PBC website this week, but he deserves a ton of credit for just going to Japan uh, and taking on that kind of risk, you know, daring to be great. I know that's like a, a phrase we use a lot, but Stephen Fulton truly dared to be great. And you know it because he's done that throughout his career. It was like the 10th undefeated fighter he's fought and he's only had 20 fights. You know, he's he's that kind of fighter. So, you know, I do expect him to bounce back. I hope he continues to hold his head up no shame in what happened just you know uh some folks may view it as a loss other folks may view it as a lesson so um you echo those sentiments and i i uh i, I let, let, sorry let, let me let me just ask this i mean who who does that you know right. it, it, in boxing if if more fighters did what fulton did in this case how much more interesting would boxing be yeah yeah you know it'd be something else so um you know more more props to to Naya in a way on, on proving his greatness and and to Stephen Fulton for daring to be great I think a lot of great fights are out there for him once he's you know ready to uh, get back in the ring all right from one great fight to a legendary one let's move into the PBC fight of the week we've talked about it to death I mean, to death, and we're still talking about it. I, I don't even think you can call this the PBC fight of the week. This feels like the, the PBC fight of all time. Errol Spence Jr. versus Terrence Crawford for the undisputed welterweight championship. Uh, Saturday night, I mean, I think everyone knows by now, Showtime pay-per-view, the T-Mobile Arena um, in Las Vegas, the fight we've all been waiting for for five years. There's uh, just so much to to unpack, so much that we're going to get into. But, Mike, let's uh, let's start things off with the essentials. Okay, here we go. Uh, Spence, 28-0, 22 knockouts. Crawford, 39-0, 30 knockouts. I love the fact that they're a combined 67-0. Uh, obviously, both 5-0 and in their last five. Spence with two knockouts. Crawford with five. Last fight for Spence. Uh, he stopped your Dennis Ugas in 10 rounds in April of last year. It means he'll be out of the ring. For, he will have been out of the ring for 15 months. Uh, Crawford uh, stopped David Avanesian in six rounds last December. Uh, similar knockout ratio. Spence 79%. Crawford 77%. Spence 142 rounds in the pros, Crawford 224, uh, Spence is 33, Crawford 35, Spence turned pro 2012, Crawford 2008, they're both southpaws. I thought the dimensions were kind of interesting, Spence is a little taller, 5'9 and a half, Crawford 5'8, but Crawford has a 74 to 72 inch uh, reach advantage. Uh, Spence, as we know, is from the Dallas area, and Bud Crawford is from Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, those are those are some really interesting statistics there. Some things actually kind of uh, popped out to me. Uh, the rounds fought, you know, uh, that's that's interesting. But Errol obviously has, you know, wealth of uh, amateurs. Oh, yeah. We'll uh, we'll get into that uh, yeah. a little yeah. later. But what makes this such a great matchup? I mean, I could write a book on this. Where, where do I start? Uh, you know, they're both, you know, in the top few guys, pound for pound. Uh, they're both undefeated. Uh, they're not kids anymore, but they're both at least near their peaks, which uh, is saying something given their ability. Uh, they both happen to fight in the same division, which is just a happy coincidence, really, if you stop and think about it. Uh, it's just so rare that a fight like this is made, maybe once every several years, if that. Uh, and rare things are often precious things. This matchup is just absolutely precious if you're a boxing fan. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned how rare a matchup like this is. Can you speak to the, the historical uh, significance of this bout? Yeah, the first thing I think about when I think about that is the division, the welterweight division, which is one of the sports glamour uh, divisions. Uh, this is a fight that, you know, barring anything unexpected, will crown the best 147-pounder you know, in the post Mayweather Pacquiao era. So that's a big deal. 
Uh, this is Leonard Hearns, Leonard Duran, Trinidad de la Hoya, Mayweather Pacquiao, you know, at least on paper. It's the kind of matchup that you could end up talking about like the rest of your life if you're a boxing fan. Yeah, I think, you know, this one reminds me a lot of uh, Trinidad, de la Hoya versus Trinidad, simply because both guys are undefeated, even when Mayweather fought Pacquiao. And, you know, Pacquiao had several losses, including, you know, one a few years prior. But, um, you know, these are two undefeated guys, like like you mentioned. So I think about that fight where, you know, folks were so divided uh, leading up to, to fight night. What fight would you compare this one to? You know, I know you're going to ask me this, so I sort of racked my brain. And honestly, I, I think it's it's a, it's its own fight. Um, actually, I think your, your comparison to Trinidad de Loa is pretty interesting, though. Um, you know, I thought about all the fights that I just mentioned, and uh, I really couldn't find the perfect parallel. But I will say this. Uh, it's like Mayweather Pacquiao in the sense that it percolated for so long. Uh, which is bad in one sense, you know, we just, you know, it's painful to watch that process take place, but it's good in another sense because it's so exciting when it finally happens. So it yeah. reminds me of Mayweather Pacquiao from like an excitement level. Yeah. And so much, it's so much bigger when it happens when you have that way too, for better or worse. I mean, right. we saw how uh, Mayweather and Pacquiao just ballooned into the mega fight, the biggest fight ever. And it, and this fight Spence versus Crawford is definitely significantly bigger than it was um five years ago Absolutely. based on uh, what you've seen you know thus far during the, the build-up and the promo from the press tours to you know to all the interviews uh the, that they've done what are your thoughts so far on the mentality of each fighter you know it comes down to personalities it's difficult to get into the heads of these guys because of their personalities they're both really low key, even quiet by nature, uh, you know, not unusually brash or anything like that. It's sort of just how they are. Uh, the promotion has been, from my perspective, been kind of tame as a result. Um, I think they both understand and appreciate the fact that they're part part of a historic an event, which is really nice to see. Uh, and I think they have respect for each other, which is kind of how it's supposed to be. Yeah. You know, they're behaving like professionals. You know, that's that's how it's supposed to be. They're supposed to behave like professionals. But, you know, but we don't have the, the crazy back and forth trash talk that does help sell a fight. But I think they'd be out of character if they did that. And, and so to answer your question directly, yeah, there's nothing I see in either guy that makes me think much about how this might be affecting them. I think they're both pros. I think they're going to be fine when they walk into the ring. Yeah, exactly. And I think that the beauty of this fight the, the, is that it needs it needs no selling. It's just it checks every single box, you know, in terms of a, a great fight. I mean, undefeated fighters. It, it speaks for itself. So they don't necessarily need to to uh, to do that. Who has the momentum heading into fight night? Uh, I don't know. You know, if you force me to pick a guy, maybe Crawford, you know, he stopped his last 10 opponents, you know, all world title fights, which I think is something, uh, you know, and he fought only seven months ago. I think Spence is rolling too. You know, he's coming off a nice knockout of your Dennis Ugas, uh, but he had the, that war with Porter only three fights ago. He was involved in the car crash in uh, October, 2019. And he, and again, he, he will have been out of the ring for 15 months. So maybe you give an edge to to Crawford, but I want to add this though. I thought I thought Spence looked terrific against Dugas, and I expect the exact same thing from him on Saturday. What does a a win here mean for each fighter? Oh man, the stakes could couldn't be any higher. You know, that's one of the main things that makes this whole thing just amazing. You know, listen, they're both Hall of Famers right now. I think they're guaranteed of that. And that obviously is a big accomplishment, uh, but a victory in this fight, particularly if it's a convincing victory, that's key. You know, that lifts the winner to the next level where very few fighters, you know, get to. Uh, that's something approaching like all time great status. You know, I don't necessarily want to go that far and overstate it, but that's sort of the direction that you're going. Um, I think a victory might be a bit more important for Crawford because Spence's resume at this moment is stronger, but it's essentially the same for both guys. It's absolutely huge. This could be the fight that we think of when we look back on the careers of these guys. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, what about what about a setback? What about a loss? What what would that mean for for each guy? Well, that would depend in good part how he loses. You know, first if it's a close competitive fight. We're probably looking at a rematch, uh, given how competitive the matchup is and uh, uh, 
how big uh, a rematch would be. Uh, then we'd have to talk about how that fight would affect the legacies of the fighters. If the loser loses badly, though, if he gets schooled or knocked out, uh, the reality is that the perception of that fighter would probably change. Uh, not necessarily radically. You know, After all, uh, the loser will have lost to either Spence or Crawford. Still, people would probably think, well, he's not quite as good as maybe we thought he was, You know, that kind of thing. So, again, there's a lot at stake, win or lose. This is uh, this is a, really a lot at stake. This is a big fight. It is. It is. It feels like a big fight. I'm, I'm, as a fight fan, I'm just so pumped. This is the, this is the fight that, you know, every fan dreams of you know we're, we're going to get into this fight a little more on toe to toe and make our predictions so let's let's jump ahead to the the co-main uh 12 round wbc and wba lightweight world title eliminator isak pitbull cruz uh versus the undefeated giovanni uh, cabrera obviously cruz is Beyond just, we saw what he did prior to the Tank Davis fight when he obliterated Diego Magdaleno, you know, 53 seconds. And then he proved in that Davis fight that he was legit. And then after that, he's been knocking out every single person who's stepped in the ring with him uh, quickly, too. Give us your thoughts on Isa Cruz. You know, I love this guy. He's both a fan and as an analyst, you know, if that's what I am. Uh, love his intensity, love his brawling style, love his ability, which maybe you don't notice necessarily because of the other stuff. Love the fact that he pushed Davis harder than anybody else has. Uh, and he's only, what, 24 years old? So he's this kid's really, really something. He's only getting started. Um, he's like a Mexican Marcos Maidana, if you will, you know, a guy who wants to rip your head off with every punch and has the skill to do it. Um, you mentioned the Magdaleno fight. I'm, I'll never forget that. If, if the listeners haven't seen that go back and watch it it's absolutely nuts um it's about as that fight's about as brutal as it gets and that's Cruz he's just absolutely brutal this guy yeah he's so so fan friendly what about his opponent uh Giovanni Cabrera what can you tell us about him so this guy is no joke uh first he's trained by Freddie Roach so he has a great mentor and he gets good sparring in Hollywood uh, he's tall, he's rangy, he's a lot taller than, than Cruz, and it looks like he's almost a head taller uh, when they were when they were nose to nose. Uh, he's also a good, busy boxer, although he's one of the things that really jumps out about is he's really awkward. He doesn't look like most guys. Uh, you know, he, his punches come from all kinds of ang angles. He moves really well, which I think makes life difficult for his opponents. Uh, you know, he's coming off his biggest win, a wide decision over a former prospect in Gabriel Flores. He put Flores down three times in the opening round. So he probably, you know, you look at his record, he's 27, 21 and 0 with seven knockouts. You don't think he's got power, but I think he does have some power. So, uh, yeah, I think this guy's, I think this guy's really good. He's definitely not a pushover. Yeah, absolutely. And he was exuding confidence at the, uh, at the grand arrivals and, uh, talking about punishing crews, which is, you know, uh, intriguing given the, the fighting style of Cruz. So how do you see the, the fight playing out? What's your pick? I don't think this is an easy fight for Cruz. I, I think Cabrera's length, his style, his ability might frustrate Cruz for a while, uh, maybe for a long while. I don't know. Uh, I just think that Cruz's pressure is going to wear Cabrera down. Uh, you know, Cruz just never stops coming. Even if he has some success early, he's still going to be in your face. He's never going to get out of your face. Uh, I'm thinking he's going to wear and then break Cabrera down and stop him late in the fight. Yeah, I, I think he definitely outworks Cabrera. Um... I, I, I like you. I think that it's going to be a competitive fight. I like uh, Cruz to win a decision against Cabrera, one that's that may be ugly at times and where, you know, he, he does take some shots. Uh, but ultimately, his I think his work rate, his power, his tenacity, um, you know, we'll, we'll see him through. But great, great co-main. Looking forward to that as well. And then another great fight, another great fighter, uh, Nonito Donaire against Alexandro Santiago for the vacant WBC Bantamweight, Bantamweight world title. Uh, Donaire, 40 years old, uh, won world titles in four divisions. He's already a Hall of Famer. In fact, he has the record in this division of, of oldest person to win the, the a Bantamweight world title at age 38. So he's looking now at 40 to break his record uh, in this division, what do you think keeps pushing Donaire when he's already established these Hall of Fame credentials? Yeah, this guy's a freak, isn't he? Uh, I th I think he's still yeah. in love. I think he's still in love with the game. 
You know, yeah. that's that's one of the main reasons that he's still an elite fighter, a legitimate contender at 40 years old. Uh, plus, he can still bring in a lot of money. He's got that name. So that's also a motivating factor. It's like yeah. he's still good, still making a lot of money, still popular. Why quit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he got uh, a really good cheer uh, uh, today at the uh, undercard media workouts. And and just the respect that other fighters give him when they when they see him. Uh, recognizing everything that that he's done, it's been really really nice to see uh, during this fight week. What about his opponent, uh, Alexandro Santiago? What can you tell us about him? So he's also no joke. You know, he could win this fight. Uh, he's a really good aggressive boxer. You know, as he demonstrated in the draw with Jerwin on Cajas in the title fight, and a close setback against Gary Antonio Russell. You know, he's a really good boxer, uh, and he's also fought. You know, 205 professional rounds. He has experience. If Donaire isn't near the top of his game and at 40, who knows? Uh, Mexico could have its next world title holder. What about Donaire? What does a win here mean for him? It would add to a, what is already a truly amazing story. You know, he won his first major title when he delivered that memorable knockout of Vic Darchini in 2007. at 16 years ago. Uh, you know, he then won eight more belts and three more divisions, you know, making him a, f- a future first ballot Hall of Famer, which I think you said earlier. Uh, and it wasn't like he was it was all smooth sailing for him. He had some setbacks. He was written off more than once, including now by some after his knockout loss to Noya Inoue. Uh, he just keeps coming back, which I think adds to his legacy. A victory in this fight would be gravy because, you know, what more can he really accomplish this guy? But it does add to his legacy, which is already special and would be even more special. So how do you see the fight playing out? Do you, uh, are you predicting him to win? Uh, honestly, this is tough. You know, I want to pick Donaire because of everything he's accomplished and how he looked as recently as December 2021 when he knocked out Raymark Gavallo and also just because he's, he's uh, Donaire. Uh, it's not that simple, though. You know, he got his you-know-what handed to him by Inouye. Uh, which was more than a year ago, and he's 40 now. And again, Santiago is 27. is really good, I think. So I'm going to go with the veteran by a late stoppage. Uh, you know, one thing I'm pretty sure he still has is his power. And, and to be perfectly honest, I just don't want to be the guy who picked against Donaire in a fight like this. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm willing to be wrong and just go with the man, which is what I'm going to do. But I won't be shocked if he doesn't win. Yeah, me neither. And I like Donaire here as well. I... Um like him to score a late round stoppage too so um or or an early stoppage who knows but we know he can still crack and and he's still got that uh mentality of of killer be killed so uh i i think this one ends inside the distance now in the uh the televised opener we've got uh yoenis Tellis versus sergio garcia 10 rounds super welterweights uh, garcia of course uh, a veteran and Tellis, uh an up-and-coming prospect what can you tell us about him, first of all? Well, he's, I should have the record in front of me. He's 6 and 0, right? Uh, he's he's really just yeah he's really just getting started so so he's a he's a he's a Cuban defector who settled in Texas you know where he's trained by Ronnie Shields so he couldn't be in better hands uh, he's not a cutie who sticks and moves like some fighters who start you know in the Cuban amateur system you know instead he's an offensive minded guy who who methodically stalks his opponents and he has the power to hurt them he doesn't look like a guy who's just starting out he kind of looks like a veteran handles himself really well in the ring you know when I just watched him on YouTube, a couple of fights. I just thought, man, this dude's a badass. I really liked what I saw. Wow. That's, I mean, that is uh, some high praise. And I guess that's why they're putting him in with someone the caliber of Sergio Garcia, who's been in there with top uh, super welterweights, with the elite super welterweights. This is such a huge leap. Is it too much too soon for Tellers, in your opinion? Well, it is a big step for Tellis. Uh, Garcia is a good athletic boxer who has experience in big fights, as you just mentioned. Um, To be honest, uh, I'm a little surprised that Tellis' handlers are taking this chance. At the same time, I think they know what they have, which is a potentially special fighter. I see a lot of potential there. Uh, So I'm going to say no. This isn't too much too soon for him. Uh, But obviously, we're going to see. I might be completely wrong. Yeah, well, it doesn't, you know, I, tell us is another fighter who's exuding confidence. So um, curious to see what, what he looks like when he makes this step up. How do you see the fight playing out? So I, I'm rolling with Tellis. You know, I think I think Garcia is going to give Tellis trouble in the first half because of his skill set, because of his experience. Uh, 
you know, Tellis strikes me as the kind of kid who won't be phased, though. He won't get frazzled no matter what happens. Uh, I think he'll use intelligent pressure to slowly but surely get to Garcia. And I think he's either going to win a clear decision or even stop him, you know, in the last couple of rounds. Uh, I think this kid's got it. I really can't wait to see what happens. That would be impressive. I mean, I, I like Tellis as well by decision, though. But if he were to, and I think he learns a couple of things in this fight. But, hey, look, if he were to score uh, a stoppage of Sergio Garcia, that would turn a lot of heads. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what we see from the young kid. Let's bring in our guest uh, this week. He's an undefeated super middleweight representing Omaha, Nebraska, of course, Team Team Crawford. Uh, he's going to take on Rowdy Montgomery in the uh, main event of the Showtime stream beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern time on the Showtime YouTube page. Steven So Cold Nelson. Steven, you're you're making your 2023 debut this Saturday night. How does it feel to be back in the ring? Um, it feels it feels great, man. I feel like it's it's that time for me to get back rolling and uh get some things moving so I can get some big fights coming in. Now, this is also your premier boxing champions debut. What can you tell us how, about how that has been for you and and for the team? Um, I've been watching uh, PBC since they um, first started up, and I always was like, you know, it'd be cool to be a part of that um, because they have a lot of great champions and everything. By the time I was with the top rank, and then I was um, free agent when I came back last year from my injury. So it's perfect timing. You know, it's perfect timing for me to transition over to uh, – this platform and get this opportunity to show them that like I'm a force to be reckoned with. Love it. What can you tell us about your opponent, Rowdy Montgomery, aside from the fact that he has a cool name? Yeah. I, I said, that. I was like, oh, that's a cool old name. But, um, I mean, honestly, uh, he's the last minute replacement. Uh, we watched him, you know, I feel like for me to, first get back it's a it's a good fight for me to come back and uh get some rounds in knock off some ring rust um but like anybody you get in there with you know it's a it's a um you know it's it's this danger in there you know with these guys who who train every day like i do so um he's a good solid opponent you mentioned uh, getting back in the ring, getting some rounds in. Uh, do you also want to make a statement in this fight, being that it's sort of a comeback fight? Yeah, for sure. Anytime I, anytime I'm in front of any crowd, whether it's ten people or ten thousand people, you know, I'm always, you know, put on a show. Whether it's uh, entertainment or you know my skill or you know if if. People like my walkouts, you know, I make my own uniforms and people like look forward to the different walkouts I do. And, you know, just my performance and all, you know, I'm always, you know, want to entertain because that's what this sport is. You know, at the end of the day, we are in there fighting, but it's for entertainment. Now, in the uh, in the main event, your friend, your teammate, uh, Terrence Crawford takes on Errol Spence for the uh, undisputed welterweight title. How has camp been, and and what are your thoughts on Terrence's mindset heading into this epic fight? Um, I think in camp, that's the biggest thing that has changed for us. the The training and everything is is the same. Like we always say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, and it's not like we train up to our opponents. We always train. For world title fights you know my first fight i was training next to bud while he was training for a world title fight he was doing the same thing so it was like i was fighting a four-rounder you know <laughs> training training like i'm about to fight a world title 12 but in this training camp bud like his mindset and his his enthusiasm is on a whole different level um, he just know he's at that point where it's like this is this is the the tip top of what you can accomplish in boxing. Like, what more could you do besides make history and you know be unified, like undisputed? 
like there's nothing great. He's done everything. He's been fighter of the year. He's been he's been to the SB awards. He's you know he's he's unified. He's been undisputed before. He's won world titles. He's defended them. He's done everything. But there's nothing greater than this point to fight the number one and two pound for pound guys out there. Why do you believe uh, Bud beats Errol Spence? Um. You know, I, I tell people all the time, I try to be unbiased being that we friends, but, you know, I personally you know Errol Spence. You know, I went to London with him for the Olympics. I was on the Olympic team with him. And I give him all credit. He's the great champion. But Bud is just a different – he's a different breed. And when I say that, like, every point, every, every way I can say – he checks off. He's 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 a better boxer. You know, he he punches hard. He moves better. His footwork, his speed, his timing, switch stance, his ring generalship, his IQ is like everything he brings to the table is better than Spence to me. And um, you know, for a fight like this, it just takes for him to actually go in there and just be him. Don't go in there and overthink. Don't go in there and try to do something that we haven't been doing. Just be you, man. And the fight is his. I tell him, I've been telling him, I sit down, we talk, and we ride to the gym. I'm like, man, how you feel? Well, I feel good. I'm like, no, like, 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 like mentally, how you feel? But I'm good, man. I'm straight, everything. And, you know, he's, he's enthusiastic and stuff like that. He just have a high, you know, he just really like into the zone, and it's and it's and it's beautiful to watch and see. And it's, it's all it takes is for him to go in here and do what he's supposed to do, and it's gonna be the cherry on top. It's gonna be like, man, that was a beautiful story to be a part of. So you and Terrence go back way back in Omaha, to my understanding. Can you tell us how you two met and how the relationship developed? Um, in Omaha, Nebraska, uh. How our community is is most of the black people are in like North Omaha, and you have you you have like the people with like more money and more opportunities. They live in West Omaha, and you have the Mexicans living in South Omaha, and the East Omaha is going to like where the airport is everything at. So when you're in the community in the black community and you're young and stuff, you hear about certain people, and I always like heard about oh this is a good boxer. We was young, Bud and and Bernie was one of them. There's certain names you hear, Bud, Bernie, and uh, and one day I ran into him at a at the park. We was like, I think we were like 11 years old. I ran into him at the park, and I always heard his name around. And he was just messing with people, come around like frogging us in the R. He was just, you know, we was hanging out. And from that day point, like I started seeing him all the time. We started hanging out, and as as we started going to schools together, Central High School, um, and we just became friends. We started being around. Went to a couple of his fights. I went to the time he was at. He was in Golden Golden Glove Finals. 2007, uh, I was there for that, and I felt like he won it, but they took it from him in the finals. Uh, and we just been friends, but I wasn't boxing. I never, I wasn't boxing growing up. I went to the military because in my, in, I was hanging around with the wrong people and with the wrong crowd, and you know, getting in fights, getting jumped. I ended up getting shot, um, and I just needed to get away. I ain't had no structure in life, and I went to the military. Went to the military, changed my life around. Long story short, and went to Afghanistan. Came back from Afghanistan and started boxing, uh, just to do something on the side. And turned out to be a natural talent of mine. And the first person I called when I started boxing was Bud. I was like, man, you know, I'm boxing now, and I'm out here. I'm I'm out here kicking everybody ass. I need to get in the ring with you. He was like, man, you ain't ready, ready on this level yet. And he was already pro. I was like, man, I'm telling you, man, man, you too small. He said, all right, when you come back home, we can get in the ring. So I went back home to Omaha, and we spar, and that's what let me know that I needed to do a lot to grow. And I went back to North Carolina and started training harder and got way better 
And like me and Bud, we just been, you know, like this. Where were since. you at? Were you in Fort Bragg? Where, where, where yeah, you? I was in Fort Bragg. Okay, okay. That's cool. Yeah, I was in yeah, I was in Fort Bragg. And that's that's when when I started boxing, that's when me and Bud were like really, really tight. Before we were really close because like um it was a couple of times where things happened. And he always had my back, and we were and we were friends. But when I started boxing, that's when we became tight. Where you see him, you see me. Like it's like this is my dog, right? Because we doing the same thing. We got the same vision. We both come from a bad background. Both been through uh, different things. We both like we have similar stories. So we just became like really like best friends talked about you wanted to fight to to fight bud or to spar bud um what yeah you know have you and and if so you know what is it that makes him so good um just his diversity his diversity but the biggest thing because you can teach a lot of boxers different skills in boxing but one thing you can't teach a fighter is heart competitiveness like I have never met nobody. I'm not just saying this for the podcast or whatever, or, or, you know, this platform, like Bud is truly the most competitive person I have ever met in my life with any, I don't care what it is. Don't matter. He, he, he might, man, you drink your gallon of water today. I'm like, yeah, he might let me see. I bet y'all drink more than you. I'm like, dude, it's drinking water. Like, like, dude, he's competitive with everything. Debates, arguments if it's physical if it's games video games ping pong chess everything man who dog who dog is the most vicious who car is the fastest it's everything i don't care what it is in this world but it's going to be competitive with it let, let me ask you something because i i think about the ages of both uh bud and, and arrow 35 and 33 and i know you're 35 and you've been with with bud for a long time is he physically the yeah. same guy even in his in his mid thirties? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see anything physically different. You know, I think we train even harder now sometimes, uh, but we we the difference I see in Bud with his age is wisdom when it comes to training and knowing when to pull back and how to take care of his body and get massage. Before we used to be, it was like caveman style. We go work out, we train, we leave. He'd be like, let's get up and go do it again and do this. But now he'd be more smart. He'd, he'd get on training. He'd call him a suits, get a massage, you know, do that, do like an Epsom salt bath. He'd take care of himself and, and do things with more wisdom now, he's 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 wiser. He 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 does things better now. But as far as abilities and and like physical attributes, I don't see anything uh, any difference. I mean, his fights. You know, I look back at his earlier fights we used to go to when he fought on small cards, or we find someone on YouTube. He's a way better fighter uh, than he was. Like I said, because he just picked up different things from the experience in the ring as a pro. Getting back to you for a second. So you mentioned your uniforms. You actually sew and design your own uniforms. How did how'd you get that skill? Yeah. I I sew and design my own uniforms. I design Bud uniforms as well, but I don't sew his because he's he signed with Everlast. So I just design them and send them and send the design over to Everlast and they make them. Wow. But I start doing it with I do a lot of different things and it's always because I'm a perfectionist and when I pay somebody or I want somebody to do something, they never do it to my quality or just to miss all the middle man and all the extra BS that come with Like I just got up this morning and cut my own hair. <laughs> I was like, you know what? Just, just, just to have that skill. I love learning new things. So when I first went pro, I paid somebody to do my first uniform and it was like three months prior, prior to my, I mean, three months before my, uh, my fight. And the whole time he hit him up like, hey, hey, how's it going? He's like, oh, it's going good, going good. It got all the way until the day of my fight before I received the package at the hotel. 
it was a little package, little priority box. I'm like, ain't no way my uniform in the three quarter man jacket fit in this box. <laughs> I opened it up and it was just some shorts. I was like, man, this dude played me, man. And I said, you know what? I'm about to just make my own uniforms. Well, I guess we'll see what you come out with on uh on Saturday night. But it seems yeah. like you got a few talents because you, you got a bit of some comedian skills too. Like you post a lot of yeah. Uh, funny videos and stuff. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, oh, yeah. My, I started doing that for my injury. When I injured. I was like, I need to do something about time, and I started uh, doing stand up comedy, and I learned how to fly planes too. Renaissance. Yeah, man. I, yeah. I went and I had some money saved up from fighting, and I went and took private lessons on flying planes. So I'm a couple hours away from my. Um, pilot license it was it was cool because on the way out here we flew private and the and the um pilot let me be the co-pilot oh no so i flew the team out with, nah, with the with the, with the pilot co -pilot. you say what now you think you're still working on getting your license right now yeah yeah I, yeah i'm a few hours i just been training so much uh since i came in from my injury that i that i pulled back from it but uh i'm definitely gonna get back to it and get that license so i can you know that's one of my dreams is just have my own little private plane and fly the team around and do stuff like that if i, if I was bud and, they, and the pilot said all right well let's steven uh you know i would be like let me off this plane right right now not until he's got a few more yeah. It, it, was, it was good. We, we got we got footage. It was, I posted it online That's on awesome. the social media. Everybody was like, man, you put a team out there. It was like crazy. Yeah, it was fun. Like, but but they trust me. You know that's why that's where I got my name from. So cold because they just know that anything I do, I'm gonna put a hundred percent, hundred and fifty percent, and I'm gonna do it my best. And I'm gonna always master whatever I do. So the team they come to me for all different types of things all throughout camp, you know. Hey, Steve, this broke. This fix, fix this. What you know about this? Can you do that? Can you, you know, I'm always, you know, doing stuff, you know. So the team, they trust me. They trust me with with, with, with things like that. That's awesome. Um, getting getting back to boxing, you know, you, you're 35, you're undefeated. You had, you know, a couple years off. But you've always been known as as a big puncher with with skills do you feel like you're in a, a race against the clock as far as your career um most definitely you know i can sit here and 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 say oh, oh no i ain't no system but let's be real like boxing is, is there's a there's a time stamp on boxing and um even though like my whole life i didn't play any like organized sports I played them on the side, like pick up games and stuff like that. So I didn't really beat my body up a lot. You know, I didn't start really getting physical until I went to the military. So I have a I have a little bit of, you know, edge to me for my age compared to other, you know, counterparts that are the same age as me. So I feel like I have a little bit more time, but time is still ticking and I don't have time to sit around and and play and take some years off and, and you know and you know take all these small fights you know that's why i was kind of upset that you know my original opponent he was undefeated pulled out but you know like i feel like i put on this play a great display and show them that this guy don't belong in the ring with me and you know i will push for a bigger you know more notable fight and uh it's gonna come you know, just I just be patient like everything else, man. Timing is everything. My time is going to come. Um, it's a plan. God has a plan for me, and I just follow the road and keep doing. I do and don't even think about it and look at it. But I, I'm still, you know, relying on and pay attention to. You know, I have to keep, you know, moving and doing doing things. I I have to do my part. So as you as you chart your course for the next year or two, you know who would you like to fight? What names stand out to you? Um, names. It's funny because I've been calling this guy out forever, only because you know he had words for me, and um, I didn't like how the NABO uh, released my title and let him fight for it with Edgar Belonga. I want to fight him. 
I, I want to fight him not only because business, but also because it was a personal vendetta too. But uh, I want to fight guys like because I'm. I mean, realistically, you know, I will. My dream is to have a fight like Canelo, you know, undisputed champ. But realistically, I had to put myself in that position where he can lick his chops like, okay, this is a good opponent. You know, so I had to get guys like, you know, the Eggers and, and the upcoming other champions out there to put myself in the light of, I wonder how he would do with Canelo. And that's the goal. Anybody that's in the way of getting to the world titles. Steven, I, this has really been a pleasure. You know, you're like the renaissance man of boxing. Uh, I'm amazed at all the stuff you, you can and, and do with yourself. It's it's really amazing. And it's a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, definitely, man. I had a great, a great conversation with you guys. I love the questions. And I'm always here you know, to talk to the people and to let them know this. Keep a lookout for Stephen Soko Nelson, man, because just being inspired in so many different ways, people can gravitate towards me and uh, learn and be inspired to do so much with themselves. Well, well we're great stuff. All the best on, on, on Saturday night, man. We look forward to having you back on afterward, too. Yep, I'll definitely be back on uh, afterwards, man. Post fight interview, whatever, man. Just hit me up, let me know. All right, sounds Thanks, good. Steve. Thank you. Take care. Once in a generation, the time has come. A fight makes history. It's champion versus champion. Before anyone steps in the ring, Errol Spence Jr., Terrence Crawford. The most anticipated fight of the decade is here. Beat him up. Undefeated, undisputed, unprecedented. Spence versus Crawford for the undisputed world title, Saturday, July 29th, live on pay-per-view. It's time for Mike and I to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. This week, of course, we're going to be breaking down Errol Spence Jr. versus Terrence Crawford Saturday night, Showtime pay-per-view from Las Vegas. Every time, I mean, my, my heart rate picks up every time I, I say Errol Spence versus Terrence Crawford. I'm, you know, trying to make it to Saturday night because at this point, I don't know if I will. But uh, what Mike and I do here uh, when we do the fighter breakdown is is we do it by category. We have a series of, of 10 categories, I believe, Mike. Is it 10 or 9? Nine? Nine, uh, nine, nine, cat, nine categories. categories. That we uh, rate the fighters from on, on a 1 to 5 scale. Of course, 1 being the lowest, 5 being the highest. Give them each a 1 to 5 rating in each category. And then we tally it up at the end. And... Um, and and see who comes out on, on on top of this breakdown. So, Mike, let's start off with uh, amateur foundation. How do you rate both these guys? Hey, real quick, I, I sometimes I preface the toe to toe. Um, this was maybe the hardest one, hardest fighter breakdown to do because it's so hard to separate these two, which is one of the one of the elements of this that makes this fight so fascinating. Uh, so here we go, amateur foundation. Uh, I gave Spence a five. I gave Crawford a four. Uh, Spence had a strong amateur career. You know, he reportedly was 135 and 12 as an amateur. He won multiple U.S. championships and he competed in the uh, 2012 Olympics. I think he was eliminated in the third round, I want to say. Uh, Crawford didn't have as much experience as an amateur. He reportedly was 58 and 12, you know, but also had some success nationally. Uh, and he did compete in the trials ahead of the 2008 Olympics. You know, he, he lost, he lost to, uh, Saddam Ali in the quarterfinals of the trials. Uh, I think they both have strong fundamental amateur foundations, but I'll give the edge to Spence. I think he did a little bit more. Yeah, I think you, you. Uh, nothing else to be said. I'm like I'm with you. I have it. Uh, I have a five for Spence. I have a a four for Crawford. What about skill set? Uh, I gave both guys a five. Um, it seems to me that Spence might be a tad better than Crawford in terms of just pure technical skills. Um, I think consensus is that Spence just does everything right. He's like that kind of guy. Uh, I don't think there's a significant gap between them, though. You know, Crawford is a master of just patiently, methodically breaking down his opponents, which takes a lot of ability. Uh, in other words, he just he doesn't use just brute force to do that. It's very, very well thought out and well executed. Uh, I think both of these guys are master boxers. So this category is a push for me. Yeah, same here. Five, five and five here. Look, these are two of the best fighters 
in the world. There's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, so in terms of skill set, both of them are the highest score we can give them. What about speed athleticism? So I gave Spence a four and Crawford a five, and I'll explain why, because I think Spence is really quick and a really good athlete. Uh, I think Crawford has an edge here. Uh, he He's super quick, super athletic, and super dynamic, you know, which, you know, combined with his skill set, excuse me, his skill set and his punching power has made him uh, such a dominating fighter. He just overwhelms his opponents with all of the above. Spence also, again, Spence also is quick and athletic. Uh, but to me, he's a, he's a little bit more mechanical or machine-like, if you will, than Crawford is. So I just felt that this is like Crawford's one of his biggest strengths, so I needed to give him an edge. So, yeah, Spence four and Crawford five. Yeah, you know what? I'm with you. Uh, I, I've got four and five as well. I, I think Spence's athleticism is, is sort of underrated because he really doesn't use it unless he sort of has to. But there's no denying that it's a integral part of, of Crawford's game and he is blessed with you know he's, he's just an athlete you know someone who would probably excel in multiple sports and um you know uh, great reflexes and 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 movement and and speed and, and quickness what about punching power so I thought long and hard on this one which is always one of the more interesting categories uh, I landed on five and five um a, another another push uh I think I think maybe Crawford punches a little bit harder than Spence. Uh, I love the the 10, 10 fight knockout streak in world title fights that he's on right now going into this fight. Uh, that's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to get keep knocking guys out, you know, fight after fight after fight, you know, as your com- as your competition gets harder. Uh, it reminds me of Gennady Golovkin's run. Uh, Crawford's the kind of guy who could hurt you at any time, uh, and he's just a lethal finisher, uh, which we've seen over and over again. I think Spence hunt punches really hard too, though. You know, look what he did to Kel Brook. He broke the guy's face, uh, and he put Porter down uh, when you know late in the fight when he had to. Um, and he actually has a slightly higher, as I said earlier, he has a slightly higher knockout percentage than than Crawford. So in the end, I have to call this even. Yeah, so do I. I've got it five and five. Uh, different kinds of power but but both are heavy hitters nonetheless what about physical strength another one i had to think about a lot um so i I gave them both five again um you know what if 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 you'd asked me this uh three years ago i think i would have given spence an advantage uh but crawford's now had what seven fights at welterweight so i think he's completely grown into the division so i i see these guys you know both is strong strapping welterweights i mean just look at the power level of both guys um yeah so uh in the end this is another example of a of a of a push for me it's five and five i gave i gave spence a five i gave crawford a four um i i do i agree with you i think that crawford has grown into the division and is a big strong guy at 147 i just think errol's the biggest guy at at 147 you know this this category kind of reminds me of the speed athleticism category where i think crawford's physical strength is is underrated but but spence's physical strength is elite you know in in rare air in, in terms of all weight so i give him a slight uh advantage there what about versatility uh so that's another five five for me. I feel like I'm giving too many five fives, but these these Same this, here. Is, this, this, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about Spence and Crawford. I think this was sort of inevitable uh, with these two guys. And again, these are two guys that just don't have really don't have weaknesses. Uh, so when I when I think of Spence, I think of versatility. That's one of the first things I think of. Uh, he outboxed a boxer in Mikey Garcia intentionally too, and then out brawled a brawler in Sean Porter. And you know, in the, in the fight following fight. You know, he's like a chameleon, whatever it takes to win. Uh, Crawford's the same, though. You know, he's a guy who can do it all. You know, he's def- that's definitely Crawford. You know, he can beat you in many ways. Uh, Crawford hasn't had to adjust much to his opponents because he generally dictates the action. Uh, but I know he has the ability to do it if he has to. You know, maybe we'll see on Saturday um, how he adjusts. But um, I think he can do whatever he needs to do to, to win the fight. Yeah, and we've seen him adjust. I mean, seen like we saw him adjust against Sean Porter. Uh, you know, so even in that brief fight against uh, uh, Kel Brook, he he made some adjustments to to Brook's jab. So I'm with you. I've got five and five both for versatility. What about durability? It's another five five. Uh, you know, Spence was thrown out of a speeding car and fought a year later. You know, that's durable. Um, 
you know, he also survived a really grueling fight against Porter. You know, the kind of fight that could shorten a boxer's career. He bounced back, though. Uh, tough, tough guy. Crawford, I, I, you know, I think he's been stunned once or twice, but like Spence, he's never been down. You know, either guy's ever been on the canvas. Another thing to to, to bring up. Uh, Kavaliowskis, if that's how you say his name, he came pretty close to putting uh, Crawford down, but he didn't go down. Um, I think that's saying something, given the fact that the guys had 40, almost 40 fights, 39 fights, uh, many of them title fights. So I, I see both of these guys as really durable. Yeah, I agree with you. I've got five and five here. I think, yeah, we've seen Crawford hurt before, uh, but I think the fact that he's able to come out of that and bounce back and uh, sometimes hurt the guy in that same round speaks to speaks to his durability and his and his conditioning. Um, how about experience? So that this is maybe the easiest category. This in skill set, I think. So this is another five five. Uh, Spence. Yeah. <laughs> Spence has a more robust had a more robust amateur career, as I said, uh, and he's taken part in more big fights. Uh, as a professional, maybe, uh, but Crawford has had his share of high, high profile bouts and he has that big edge in uh, professional rounds fought that I mentioned above, I think something like 80 more rounds, uh, bottom line though, you know, both of these guys have seen and done it all. No one has an edge here. They both are definite fives. Yeah. Same here. Five and five. These guys have uh, plenty of rounds, pl- plenty of amateur experience. Nothing, nothing in there is going to surprise them at this stage. And the last category freshness. So, yeah, so I had to think, to really think about this one and ended up again with a with a five five uh i think they're both fresh you know which can be good and bad at the same time you know again spence will have been out of the ring for 15 months you know that gave his body time to heal from whatever might have been ailing it at, the, at that time uh it also could produce rust though um although i have a feeling it won't uh crawford has had only two fights in almost three years uh there's not a lot of wear and tear there either, you know, but you could also argue maybe you should have been a little bit more active. I don't know. Anyway, these guys aren't young, but they seem to be very well preserved. Yeah, I actually gave both a four and four uh, uh, because of the uh, the questions that they that they have. Errol obviously has been out of the ring since April uh, of last year. And of course, we, we know everything that he's gone through. And and Crawford, while well preserved, is still. Uh, 35 years old, you know, going on 36 and and hasn't used his legs as much in recent fights. And, hey, who knows? Maybe they're still there. But, um, you know, I, I called it even, but at, at four for both. All right. Uh, let's let's tally this thing up. What do you got? So this was the easiest uh, math problem that I've ever had doing one doing one of these things. Um, I gave each guy only one four. So I'm 44 to 44. I've got it 43 to 42 for Errol Spence. Um but uh, very close. I mean, you know, could have could have gone either way. So uh, I, I love it. I can't wait for this fight. And before we get to Saturday night, Mike, I need your pick. Who's winning? So, you know, I think I've said this 100 times, but it's essentially a 50-50 fight. Uh, you know, the fact that Crawford and Spence ended up with the same number of points on my scorecard here. Uh, is an indication of my respect for Spence and the fact um, that he has a really good chance of winning this fight, uh, which is one of the reasons it's so fascinating. Um, I just think that Crawford brings a little bit more than Spence into the ring. Uh, Both men can box. Both men can punch. Both have a lot of dog in them. There's no question about that. The difference to me is that Crawford is quicker He's a quicker, better, more dynamic athlete of the two, which we got into earlier. Um, he's cut from a similar cloth to that of Noya in a way. Uh, I see him beating Spence to the punch, getting in and out without taking too much punishment, you know, and generally controlling the distance with his feet. You know, his hands are fast, his feet are fast too. Uh, in other words, I see him staying a step ahead of Spence the entire fight. Not, not a big step, just a, a slight step, but nevertheless a step ahead. Uh, Spence is too good to underestimate, but I think this is Crawford's moment. I think he becomes the first man to become undisputed champion in the second division in the four belt era, era by a clear decision. You know, I didn't mention that, you know, about his, about the legacy of whoever wins this fight. Uh, the guy be, uh, becomes the undisputed champion in, in Crawford's case to be the first guy to become undisputed champion in the second division. So add that to his legacy if he can do it. 
Yeah, that's and that's really special. And I and I can see that path to victory for Terrence Crawford. I think you laid it out pretty well. And I can certainly see that happen. It speaks to, to his versatility, his skill set, his ring IQ. And I could see him put on a special performance, but I can also see Errol Spence putting on a special performance. So I'm going with Errol Spence by late round stoppage uh, in the ninth or tenth round. I think that, you know, you, you raised a great point. Uh regarding Naoya Inoue, and I forget the name of the tweeter. I'm so sorry. I'm not stealing this from you, bro. Uh, I wish I remembered your name, so repost if I can find it, but I uh, one poster compared this fight to Vernon Forrest versus Shane Mosley, the first fight, where Mosley was the more dynamic fighter, athletic, cat-like reflexes, dynamite power, and he was... Uh, those attributes were nullified by... Uh, Forces size, jab, and and fundamentals, and I think we're going to see Spence uh, be what he is. Uh, his greatest weapon, I think, the the big secret about Errol Spence that he really is a boxer disguised as a come forward uh, puncher, and so I think he's going to use the jab to to break. Uh, Crawford down, fight at a pace that he may not necessarily always be accustomed to. And if Crawford is a thinking fighter, I think that uh, Spence is going to force him to think quicker than he typically does and drag him into deep waters where the big fish uh, might swallow him up. So that's my prediction. But, but this is really a 50-50 fight. This could go either way. I see p- multiple paths to victory for each fighter. I mean, if, if, it, end, it, if it ended early on Saturday night, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, if it ended late, if it was a war where you couldn't tell who won, I don't know. But I think we're going to see a special performance from someone on Saturday night. I could see Crawford delivering that, but I, I can see Spence doing that too, and I believe that Errol Spence will. That's a, that's a really interesting comparison between uh, this fight and the and the Forest Moza. I'm trying to in my mind. I'm trying to because I was there with Shane. You know, most of his career, he's LA guy, and I'm an LA guy. So I was there for his, most of his career and uh, trying to in my mind compare him to Crawford. A uh, ton of respect for Shane uh, and love the guy too. One of the best people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's a really int- I really like that comparison, and I could see actually that's an it's an interesting scenario that that you laid out that could that could happen. You know, the nat- naturally bigger guy, great jab, uh, physically strong guy. Uh, and Crawford, please. Crawford might be a little bit better boxer than Mosley was, but very, very interesting. And you know, what I also found interesting is that both guys sort of openly acknowledge the possibility of losing. Yeah. Uh, so I think in their minds they also see scenarios where the other guy where the other yeah. guy wins. So I think it's all all part of what what makes this interesting. If you can come up with like legitimate scenarios where both guys win, you got something uh, going on. So exactly. yeah, you you were talking. I'm sorry, you were go, talking about how excited you were at, at the very beginning of this, and um, I don't I haven't been this excited about a fight since honestly I don't I don't remember. I, I thought about Mayweather Pacquiao, but I was a little bit. I, I still think that fight took took place a little bit too late. I think this fight is I am in the six I can't even remember the last time that I was this excited. Maybe if Canelo fights Benavides, I'll be this excited. But um yeah, this is crazy. Yeah, it is. Maybe since Mayweather Canelo, I don't know the last time I've been this excited for a fight. Um, you know, I'm excited for as a boxing fan, but there's just something special about this one. And um it's something we've been waiting for for so long. And so I am so pumped for it. I think it's going to be a great night. I see uh, something special happening regardless of the outcome uh, on, on Saturday night, and, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, we want to thank Stephen Nelson for joining us ahead of his return on Saturday night. And of course, we want to thank you guys all for tuning in uh, to this week's show. We cannot wait for Saturday night. I know you guys can't wait for Saturday night. And of course, we'll be right back to discuss it next week, the outcome and break it all down for you guys right here on the PBC podcast.